well this morning? Yes. It's a beautiful day. Yes. Uh, we had some good time yesterday cleaning the church. When I came over, I had to cover my eyes. It was so shiny. Uh, anyway, what I want to talk to you about this morning, I talked about this Wednesday night. Uh, sometimes I like to recycle the things that I say. Um, but I want to share some thoughts that I have with you, some things that the Lord was dealing with me uh, for the past week, week and a half. Uh, there were some things going on in, in my life that I allowed myself to be taken down, and, and, and I was uh, somewhat depressed and whatnot to the point that I didn't want to leave my my apartment for two days, which is the reason why I wasn't here last Sunday. I wasn't in in the right state of mind, and spiritually speaking, I wasn't where I was supposed to be. But the Lord impressed some things upon my heart. One of the things that uh, he put on my heart was to go back and, and listen to a teaching tape that I have that uh, is called What to Do When You're in a Trial. Uh, and I want, I want to thank him, not only for that, but also for giving me the memory that I have, because I forgot my notes at home this morning, so I just wrote them down <laughs> for what I remember, so thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, and uh, in, this, in this teaching series, there's five things that this preacher talks about that we need to know whenever we're facing a trial, and the first thing that we should know is that we shouldn't be surprised that we are in a trial. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 13, so verse 12, Beloved, do not be surpri surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And then it, it goes on with one of the most powerful words that I think there is in the English language, but rejoice. Whenever you see a but, it cancels everything that came before that. Right. Come on. So the second thing that you should know is uh, that you should rejoice whenever you're in a trial. Uh, you know, Jesus told us that this is not something that, that it's new for us. He, he told us, you know, in this world you're going to have tribulation in John chapter 16, verse 33. But... Again, take heart because I have overcome the world. And then in James chapter 1, he tells us that we should count it all joy when we meet trials of, trials of various kinds, uh, which takes us to the third thing that we should know, that it is our faith what is being tested. It's not ourselves as an, as an individual because... We don't, we don't have battles in this world. We, we have battles against spirits and principalities. It's a spiritual battle that we are fighting <coughs> constantly against the enemy because this is just alone. We are not of this world. So the fourth thing that we should know is that we should let endurance and patience, working with faith, produce the thing that we are expecting. Mm -hmm. You know, in James chapter 1, it also says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the last thing that you should know is that you should ask the Lord for wisdom, but when you do ask for wisdom, you should ask him with faith, knowing that you have received it the moment that you ask for it. So the main, the main message behind this uh, teaching series that I was uh, listening to is that every time that we're going through a trial, we should praise the Lord. We should rejoice. Why? Because miracles always come after our praise mm -hmm. and our worship. Mm -hmm. And there's a story in Second Chronicles. I'm not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time. Uh, 
but I'm pretty sure all of you know this story about Jehoshaphat when he was, uh, when they were being uh, attacked by three different uh, kingdoms. You know, he went to the Lord and he prayed and said, Lord, what am I going to, what, what should I do? And the Lord told him, you know, don't worry because this is not your battle. This is mine I'm, and I'll be glorified right. through this battle. So the next day, what did he do? Well, he sent out the, the praisers and the worshipers out. And he told them to go uh, singing, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And the moment they sang and praised the Lord and said those words, uh, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. And they basically destroyed each other. So the people from Jehoshaphat didn't have to do anything. Right. So keep, keep this in mind. Whenever you're facing a trial, just praise and worship the Lord. Amen. Because as soon as you do that, whatever you're expecting is going to come. Yeah. And there's yeah. nothing that you have to do, and he'll do it for you. So remember, as it says in Psalm 34, bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in our mouths. Yeah.
brothers here uh, about that situation, but I pray for all the kids in this neighborhood, uh, the little ones growing up, riding the bikes that they can stay, but also that they come into a relationship with the Lord. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, the Lord has called us from all around, you know, Washington and Carlisle and all over the place to come to this particular community. Um, just pray that we would be able to reach these children, the next generation rising up, that we would have the helpers and and the teachers that will help raise with the ministry here for the children. Uh, I know Suzanne and, and others have stepped up to the plate, and I really appreciate it. So I know this is something that's coming up that uh, these children just endlessly are wandering, but I know they need the Lord. And just pray for a revelation and uh, wisdom and knowledge and understanding to keep children safe in the proper facilities. And the administrators. Uh, also, I would like prayer for uh, both my mother and my sister. They're flying over next on Thursday. Yes. And they're going to be here with me for a few weeks and they're going to San Antonio to spend some time with my brother and come back for another week to be here with me and then go back home. Yes. Uh, you know, just pray that when they come here, especially my sister, whatever the Holy Spirit has in store for her, that is just pour over her like buckets of cold water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, it's going to be good. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yes, James.
chill. Let's stand. <clears throat> Let's thank the Lord this morning for everything. Father, thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for all of the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we thank you for all the works that you are doing amongst your people, for your people, and through your people. Father, we thank you for all of the miracles that are taking place. You've given us your word that we can send forth to go take care of the things and put things back in order according to your will and purpose, Lord for our lives, for the lives of others that are around us, for those that ask us in prayer, that ask us to lift, lift them up, Lord, to you. Father, we ask that you continue to bless every person in this room, those that are not here. Lord, Lord that you make yourself real to those that don't know who you are or might think they know who you are and don't understand. Father, we ask that you continue to manifest yourself in our lives and the lives of others. This is a little bit off topic, but I just remember this. The first Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the spiritual gifts. And there's one in particular that I've been asking for a long time to, to be able to, to have, and that's speaking in tongues. <laughs> it doesn't seem to happen. I don't know why. But um, if it's for me, then it'll happen. All right. Let's go ahead and while we fix our technical difficulties and go ahead with the offering. So, John and Don, would you mind? <coughs> please stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Don, would you say the blessing, please? So again, thank you to those that helped yesterday in the church work though. It was really good. Had a good time. Uh, ha, there he is. Mr. Toby. <laughs> 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 
That's the base of the, the base of the steeple that's now sitting in my backyard. But uh, probably catch Toby on the way through. Yeah. All right, on June 12th, we're going to have our Eastern Gate House of Prayer. If you're able to make it, come. It's going to be a godly time, like always. All right, let's go ahead and speak the word. We do not revive this again, and your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and that I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes and devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Myron, for all you do. And Sheila and Cindy hiding in the background. <laughs>
joy, perfect peace. Earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. Blinded by the devil, born already ruined, uh, stone cold dead as I stepped it out the room. And by his grace I've been touched, by his hand I've been healed, by his spirit I've been delivered, by his spirit I've been sealed, I've been saved. By the blood of the Lamb, I've been saved. By the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yes, I'm so glad. Yes, I'm so glad. I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I, I want to thank you, Lord. By his truth I can be upright, by his truth I can endure, by his power I've been lifted, by his love I am secure. He brought me with a price, freed me from the pit, full of emptiness and wrath, and the fire that burned me sin. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, I'm so, so glad. glad. What? So, so glad. glad. I'm so, so glad. glad. Yeah, I'm so, so glad. glad. I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. 
I want to thank you, Lord. Let's worship him. Nobody was rescuing me, nobody would dare. I was going down for the last time, by his mercy I've been spared. Not by words, but by faith, to him who is called. For so long I've been hindered, for so long I've been sold. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, I'm so, so glad. glad. So, so glad. glad. You glad? You glad? I'm so, so glad. glad. Yes, I'm so, so glad. glad. I want to thank you, Lord. 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 I want to thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. Well, if there's any debris left on the roof, it's gone now. Hallelujah.
Put it on thy seat, O Lord.
my sin is gone and I have been forgiven and when my Jesus came I gave Let's just lift our hands to the Lord right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence, for your blessing. Thank you, Thank you Lord. I ask your blessing upon everyone that's here today, Lord, and those that are unable to be here, Lord. We ask you to be with them and watch over them as well. We thank you for your grace, your goodness, and your mercy. You are a great and a mighty God. Lord. You are a good God. And we're so thankful, Lord, to know you and to have the privilege, Lord, to serve you and to, and to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's testimonies and uh, sharing your prayer request with us. We really appreciate it. It's a privilege to be able to join together in faith and just believe God for the supernatural, which is what God is. He just makes our natural super. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. And I want to personally thank everybody that was able to be here yesterday and help with the to clean up, we got quite a bit done, and so it's coming right along. Praise the Lord. It really went well. Weather held out for us, and uh, it was a little chilly, but that was a good thing because I don't think anybody broke a sweat, although we wouldn't have known because uh, with all the water being sprayed around, it was uh, kind of a done deal anyhow. Praise the Lord. But anyway, God bless all of you. Appreciate everyone that's here today. Thank you for our visitors uh, that are here. Make sure that you... Uh, Shake their hand and welcome them when you get the chance. We appreciate them being here with us today. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, I was I was talking to somebody the other day. I think it was Suzanne. You know, sometimes we we approach people uh, with information they're really not interested, really wanting. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's easy to get theological with people sometimes when that really isn't what they need. What they really need is just to know the love of God. You know, it, it's thinking of this little girl, she came home from school, third grader, she came home from school and told her mom, she said, mom, we learned how to make babies today. And her mom kind of freaked, you know, she thought, third grade and you're making babies? And, and she said, well, what did they teach you? And she said, well, you just drop the Y and add I-E-S. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, 
So sometimes we pick up things that are just really not what's out there, you know what I'm saying? So we just, you know, we just need to be sensitive to people and uh, just share the love of God with them and let God bring them along however God wants to do it. Praise the Lord. Uh, none of us, you know, really arrived overnight. In fact, none of us have arrived. We're still moving down the road. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you this morning about uh, some misconceptions sometimes that people have when it comes to the Word of God and how how easy it is. I heard someone talking about uh, the spirit of fear. And, you know, whenever you're in fear, it's not God. You can write it down. This is coming from someplace besides the Lord. Right. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and joy, and a sound mind. So uh, sometimes when... You know, history, the way we've been raised in churches, and we all come from different denominations and backgrounds and so forth, and that's all good because we all got something we can kind of add to one another and our experiences. But some of the things that we've learned in the past have really inspired more fear than they have confidence in God. And so I want to just deal with a couple of those and kind of put them in the proper context so you can understand we know what the love of God and the grace of God. And we're learning more and more of that every day. The more we depend on the Lord, the more we realize how much he does love us and wants to bless us and, uh, and deal with our human issues. You know, he's, he's not ashamed to call us brothers, even though we do some shameful stuff every once in a while. Praise the Lord. Or maybe I'm just speaking about myself. You all are just really so righteous and holy. Hallelujah. Thank God for you. Pray for me because I'm struggling. Hallelujah. I, I got to i got a human body here that i got to deal with. Praise the Lord. So, anyway, let's, let's begin with James chapter 2 and verse 17. We're just gonna, I'm going to take a couple of scriptures here that are ones that have always stood out kind of to me and that I've heard so many messages preached on that just freaked me out and made me feel like, man, I, I'm just not going to make it. I mean, I don't know if I'm even saved when I hear some of this stuff. So, we need to be, we need to be assured of the love of God and our salvation in Christ. It's a done deal. If you're a believer in Christ... You're in. Amen. You're in. You're good to go. Praise the Lord. And uh, you're as good as you're ever going to get in terms of the spirit. Now, there's, we all want to be better people, but sometimes we don't do so well at that. But you're never going to be better spiritually than you are right now if you're a believer in Christ. You are perfect in Christ. That's what the Bible says. You are the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. So that's what salvation is all about. But here's one. Even so, faith. If it hath not works, is dead being alone. Mm. Sometimes I got a lot of faith, but my works are feeble, praise the Lord. And other times I may just work like a dog. I may be really good helping people across the street, you know, hand out a little money to somebody if I got some, and, and just do really good things, but my faith is just nowhere, you know. When you read that scripture, though, it sounds like, even when you have faith, if you're not doing some good stuff along with it, then it, it's meaningless. That's kind of the context that that's always been preached, or at least that's the way I've always heard it. So I want to I deal with that uh, this morning, as well as Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 uh, through 23. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. These are just two, but they're, they kind of epitomize some of the... Uh, bogus thinking that we have based on religious concepts. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through the death to present you holy, unblameable, and reprovable in his sight. If, someone said but is the most, but if is just about the same kind of thing. <laughs> if you continue in the faith, Grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So that, that scripture kind of sounds like, you know, you've got some good stuff going for you, but only if you do a lot of good stuff as well. Right? All right. Now, let's go to Romans. And this is going to be a kind of a lengthy reading here, but just to kind of offset what we've just read, let's look at Romans chapter 10. I want to read... Sheila, verses 1 through 11 to begin with. So I'll read fast, and that way it won't take so long. <laughs> Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now this is a letter to Jews, to Hebrews, who have uh, been preached to by Paul, but not necessarily been converted. 
So he's saying, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Does that make sense to everybody? They're ignorant that it's God's righteousness that has to be imparted to us, and they're going around trying to be righteous, and in doing that, they miss God's righteousness. So, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So he's, when, when you receive Jesus, there's no more working for you to get righteousness. He's already done the work. You just receive the finished work of Christ. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That makes it pretty simple. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Praise the Lord. All right, now chapter 11, verses 5 through 8, and then we'll move right on here. Chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. He's still talking about the Jews. Within the Jewish uh, community there was a portion of them who had become believers. The rest were still under Judaism and the law. But he says there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more work. So what he's saying is, they've come, there's, a, there's a group here of Jews that have come to Christ by faith. And if it's by grace, you're saved by grace, by faith, through grace, or grace through faith. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then... Israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for, but the election hath attained it, and the rest were blinded. So this remnant that have been saved, that have come to Christ by grace, they got it. They're saved. The rest of them, they're blind. They, they, they don't even know what it is they should be looking for. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Praise the Lord. So let me back up now. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. If you continue in the faith. Now, first of all, you've got to keep in mind that continuing, and this is in the context of inobedient behavior, that is an old covenant problem. It's not a new covenant problem. It's an old covenant problem. Because if we go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 9, you'll see that that old covenant problem was solved. Praise the Lord. Technology is a wonderful thing. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the old covenant problem that we're talked about here, this continuing, is dealt with by the new covenant. Amen? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. For men verily swear by the greater... And an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So God swore by himself an oath. And that's our anchor. And that says the anchor for our soul. Meaning that it's, it's something, whenever these thoughts come, whenever, you know, because your soul is your intellect and your, your reasoning and all. 
So whenever thoughts come that, well, I'm just not doing enough and I'm not continuing as I should, that promise that God made to himself is the anchor that ought to settle any kind of confusion going on in your mind about whether you're saved, whether you're not saved, whether everything's good between you and the Lord. God made an oath and he made a promise to himself that he keeps so you're really outside of it. I mean, you don't do anything other than thank the Lord that he made this promise and he's good on his word and you can't play any part in it. You can break your promise. You could fail in that, in that uh, uh, covenant, if you will. But be, when God made this new covenant, this better covenant, man didn't have a part in it. It was God making a covenant with himself on our behalf so that we couldn't screw it up. Right? Because under the old covenant... There was a part for man to play to keep his share of the covenant. And whenever he failed, God didn't have to deal with him. God would just back away from him. But under this, that wasn't what God wanted. He wants fellowship. He wants relationship. He wants us to be sons and daughters and heirs and joint heirs. So he had to make a promise to himself that, we, that he would keep so that we couldn't mess it up. Amen. So God swore by himself this oath. And that's our anchor. That's the thing we go back to and hang on to whenever the enemy comes in and tries to tell you, well, you know, you just weren't good enough this week. Or you just shouldn't have thought that thought. Or you shouldn't have done that thing. Or you shouldn't have said that to that car that pulled out in front of you. You shouldn't have, you know, you know jumped into the cashier's line ahead of three people. And anybody ever do that? I see it happening to me all the time. I've never done it personally. But, you know, somebody's got a shopping cart with eight, 80 thousand things and they're in the express lane you know like eight items only anyway praise the lord so we are both saved and preserved because of this promise that god made to god not because we do our part right to continue right not because we're doing this continuing for the rest of our lives it doesn't work that way he made a promise to himself and that's it but we have this idea based on the scripture that it's only good if we continue to do good works or do good things or do certain, uh, you know, religious-like behavior. Amen? For all of our life. Because if any time you stop doing that, according to that scripture, you're, you're, you're just done. Okay. Stick a fork in them, right? So here's what actually happens and, and what's going on here with this uh, continuing verse and verses like it. Back in the days of the early church, there wasn't any Billy Graham type salvation prayers. Now, I know on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out and 3,000 were saved. But if you notice, they didn't ask them to pray a prayer. The Spirit just moved and people acknowledged it in a way that the Scripture had prophesied. But that isn't the way it happened all the time. All right? So, there wasn't these, you know, pray this prayer after me. Right. Now, it's nothing wrong with doing that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that just wasn't the, that wasn't the basis upon which people were saved. We do that to bring people, people's attention to an acknowledging of Christ. Right? right? But anybody could pray the prayer. It doesn't make them saved just because they said this, the words, right? So this, this, is a, this is a new, more newfangled kind of way of reaching people. That isn't what the early church was doing. But back in the days, uh, there were no altar calls because there were no altars. They did away with all the altars when Christ came. There wasn't any need for altars. Now, again, I'm not saying there's anything with all, wrong with altars. I'm just saying these are more newfangled kind of ways that we are trying to reach people and trying to bring them to a position where they will make a decision for Christ or do this or whatever. Now, I, I got... Born again at an altar, you know. But I was so naive, I didn't know what an altar was. It just looked like the front of the church to me, praise the Lord. They were talking about it being an altar, but it was just up front, you know. So I'm just saying that wasn't the, the norm for the early church when Paul and these people were literally walking around preaching to people. So there was only this, hearing with faith. Now, look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. This is what the prototype church was. This is the way they did it. Amen? I don't think it would be a bad thing to do it this way now. Hallelujah. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
Did you get born again because you did a bunch of stuff? Or any one thing? Or did you just get born again because you heard and you believed? Amen. The hearing of faith. This is, this is pure gospel. This is what they did. We do a lot of things. And a lot of the stuff we do, there's nothing wrong with it. But a lot of it is more about our expediting and trying to make things happen than it is, you know, in agreement with what they were doing. I mean, I don't ever see Jesus doing some of the stuff we see evangelists doing. Even stuff that I've done. I don't know if he was just more under control. But we really get excited and want to make somebody happy. Ah, let's go and praise the Lord. And, but I don't ever see Jesus even raising his voice. So it's more about demonstration. It's more about trying to capture people's attention. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying these are, these are more methodology than they are actually true to what Jesus does and what Jesus has done. Praise the Lord. So praise God. The, uh, this hearing of the gospel Think about it this way. It happened over days. It happened over weeks, months, even years. People were progressively exposed to the message. Whenever they would come to these church groups or these meetings where Paul or whoever it might be were preaching in houses and wherever it was they were having them, the more they came, the more they would understand, the more they would get the gospel. And somewhere along the line, spiritual birth would happen. But for some, like today, they couldn't point to a moment when they were born again. You know, I mean, some people know. They can say, on X day, X month, X year, I received Christ. I know, I remember, I felt it, I knew everything had changed. But there are a lot of people who, when you really start thinking about it, they can't really put a date on it. Right. They were just progressively learning and experiencing more, and, and God was becoming more real to them. And then one day they just realized, hey, I'm a believer. Yeah. Now, that's not wrong. Actually, there's more of that in the, in the Bible than there is of the other, where we see an immediate, sure. instantaneous kind of recognition that, hey, it happened. I got it. I, I'm born again, you know. Praise the Lord. So... This, this is a, a progressive type of receiving, amen, the gospel. So instead, this was about a, a period of time when they came to believe rather than a moment in time, a specific instant. Somewhere in that time frame, they were born of God's Spirit. It's just as valid. It's just as real. It's kind of like physical birth. I don't remember mine. But I'm here to tell you, it happened. Praise the Lord. I know, it's, I know it's real. I just can't tell you. I mean, I can give you a date because it's on my birth certificate, but I don't remember any of it. Praise God. So I know it happened. And so likewise, there are some people who recall a salvation moment. And there's others that they just began and then continued to hear. Praise the Lord. They kept listening to the message. Until at some point, that spiritual birth took place. Amen. I, can t- I can tell you, Darlene, for example, uh, others, that they weren't, they weren't in church. They weren't at an altar somewhere. They, they weren't you know, hearing songs being sung and an invitation and please repeat this prayer after me. That's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of that. I'm saying that she was progressively being led by the Spirit mm-hmm. to where she started coming to church, but she was already a believer. It's a lot of people are that way. They may not have perfect theology. They may not be able to give you all the, you know, I's and these and thou's and all the rest of it. But they know, I'm a believer. Yes, yes I believe in Christ. I believe that he died for my sins. You, you understand what I'm saying? And this is really what happened a lot in the, uh, under the uh, early church, within the early church. Amen? Amen? So Paul's saying that it's important for the Colossians here. And that's who he's talking to. That's who he's writing to. And he's, here's what he's actually telling him. He said, it's important that you continue hearing and believing. He's not saying you continue doing good works or you're not going to be saved. If you don't continue doing the right stuff from now till you pass away into the next life, then you're not going to make it. 
No, he's saying what you need to do is to continue hearing and believing. That's why, look at Colossians 1.23 again. He says that we are to continue in and receive in the receive if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached. Amen to every creature which is under heaven wherever Paul I made a minister. So he's saying you, you gotta continue in hearing this gospel that's been preached. Now just because something's preached I can testify to this, and because it's heard by people doesn't mean it has taken root in them yet. Right. I mean, I heard a lot of messages. I went. I, I was uh, a year. I mean, I don't know how long ago it was. Now, forty years ago or something. I was in uh, Maryland, and I went to a Pentecostal meeting. I was high. I mean, I was just high. But some people invited and. I didn't want to embarrass them by not going. So I went. I sat in a, in the, in a, I mean, it was, and I'd never been in a Pentecostal church before in my life. So it was, it was a real experience. It would have been a real experience if I'd have been straight. But on top of that, I'm just half out of my mind. And I got people sh- jumping and shoot, hooping and running up and down the aisles and bobby pins flying and screaming. And, and I'm thinking, my God, what, what is this? I thought it was like demonic or something. But I heard the gospel. I heard it, and it was preached, but it did not take root. So I'm saying that it happens all the time that people hear things, and they're not necessarily receiving them. And, that, and, and the, the, what Paul is saying here is that we need to continue to hear and believe in order to grasp that this gospel saves. And I heard it more and more over the years until at some point I was in a church in Texas and I heard the same gospel. It wasn't a different gospel. It was that Jesus saves, you know. I mean, there was a lot of other things that went along with it, but that's, that was the main message, and I believed. Now, I don't know that I believed just that moment, or I wouldn't have kept going back. You understand what I'm saying? We were going, you know, every Sunday, every Wednesday, all the, for several months before I actually went forward and had the whole experience. But I kept going. I, kept, I continued to hear you know, and believe what was being preached until one day I just decided to make a public proclamation of this reality, which I believe had already taken place somewhere else, but I don't know exactly when. I mean, at some other time. I, don't, I can't say exactly when that moment was. I can say when I got baptized. I can say things like that. But you understand what I'm saying? I think it happens with more of us than we really recognize because you wouldn't keep going if there wasn't something about it that you believed. I hope, right, that this is true. Amen? So that's the meaning of this continuing verses that Paul talks about. They they were not designed to cause fear in believers, although that's what they've come to do. They weren't made for that purpose. They weren't put there for that purpose. They were not meant to cause believers to fear when they were people who were already born of the Spirit of God. Why would why would God want to put fear into them? Right? right? All right, let's look at another one. James chapter 2, verse 17. Maybe you all never get bothered by any of this stuff, but I promise you this, you're going to be talking to somebody who does, who's going to say to you, well... You know, you show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by works, and we'll see who gets there, you know. It's not about just having a confrontation with somebody, but it's about setting people free. Jesus said, he that cometh unto me, amen, doesn't have to labor, doesn't have to be heavy laden, doesn't have to be burdened, doesn't have to be afraid, amen. There's peace, amen. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now you talk about self-absorption and self-inspection. This will this will cause you. I mean, this is where I came from. I mean, in early church, this is where I lived. You know, did I do enough today? Did I hand out enough tracts? Did I witness to enough people? Did I, you know, not do this? And did I not go there? And did I? I mean, 
Praise the Lord. I mean, that's just what it, that's where your head was. That's, that's kind of the way it was all the time. You were totally self-absorbed with what you were or were not doing. Right. Amen? Amen? Do I have enough works? Am I really saved? You know? And if, if you're struggling with these kind of questions, then you don't have much of the peace of God that passes understanding that Jesus came to give you, the Prince of Peace, right? I don't know how you can't, you can't connect them. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Amen? If, you, if you're struggling with those kinds of things, you don't have much rest. You're going to be busy, 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 and when you're not up busy, 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 and you're going to be laying awake at night wondering if I did enough business today or do I have to do more business tomorrow in order to make up for the lack of today's. Praise the Lord. Amen. So you, you, somehow there just isn't the peace, there isn't the rest that we're supposed to have in Christ. So this, this faith works debate has been around a long time. I mean, it's, it didn't just happen in our lifetime. It's been around for a long time. Martin Luther said James shouldn't be in the Bible. Now, this is the guy that got the revelation that just shall live by faith. Now, he was so adamant about it. Now, he had some other hang-ups, too, when it came to Israel and some other things. But he was so engrossed in this, the just shall live by faith, that he said James was a mistake. It shouldn't even be in the Bible. Now, we know it should have been or it wouldn't have been, right? But he, was, he wasn't in agreement with that. He thought, this is messing about people that should be living by faith. They're thinking, that it's, i got to do stuff. i got to do stuff, right? And the reason that he had this problem was that three times James says we are justified by works. So there's an argument going on here, and, you know, it's, it's only fair to say I can see why people come from that position of, of works. Amen? Justified by works. Three times. Look at it. Chapter 2 of James, verse 21. Chapter 2, verse 21, yes. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? All right, verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. I was like, I'm arguing against my own premise here, doesn't it? Look, okay, verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Praise God. Now this passage in James chapter 2 can't be explained away like it's a, well, it's just a secret. It's a mystery. It's, uh, you know, we don't really understand it. It's, uh, it's a secret passage about a Christian lifestyle of works after salvation. No way. The focus is justification before God, right? Justification before God. And the question that's being asked, back to verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Praise the Lord. Can that faith save him. Now, what's really mind-blowing here is actually the initial act of salvation itself is what the topic is about. Right? What does the prophet, my brother, though a man say he has faith and have not worked? Can faith save him? So he's talking about the, the real focus here is the initial act of salvation itself. And on top of that, let's go back to verse 23, Sheila. And the scripture was fulfilled with saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. So that's the verse that helps us define justified in context, right? Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. <coughs> Okay? That's, that is the context that we're talking about. That defines what justified means. 
So justification here is when we believe and when righteousness is credited to us. Understand? That's salvation. That's what salvation is. That's 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 what it means. Salvation, right? So here James is clearly saying we are justified, we are made righteous by works. Works. So what's going on here? Are we justified and accepted as righteous before God by works? Well, how does James define works? James 2.21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? What was Abraham justified by? Works. Right? Says, justified by works. When? When he offered Isaac on the altar. How many times did Abraham do that work? Once. Once. Verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. What was Rahab justified by? Works. When? When she opened the door to the spies and hid them. Amen? How many times did she do that? Once. Once. You following me? Works didn't refer to a lifelong record of works. Abraham performed not a series of works, not a lifelong work, 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 work. Amen? That his life wasn't judged or measured by a lifetime of doing works and works and works and works and works and works. And works as a result of his faith. It was one work. When he put Isaac on the altar, he believed God, then he responded. Amen? In doing so, he was justified. He was declared righteous. Righteousness was reckoned to him because he believed what God said, and then he did what God said. Once, just one time. Rahab, likewise, It wasn't a lifelong record of works as a result of her faith. Amen? It was one work. She opened the door for the spies. She believed God and responded. In doing that, she was justified. Righteousness was reckoned to her. Verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Perfected. Why? Because it was accompanied by a response to God's message. In the moment. Not over a lifetime. Right? Right? Heard God, responded when God spoke. And God declared him righteous. Rahab the same way. That's what works means here. It means to respond to the word of God. To the voice of God. James 2.17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So James is basically saying that so-called faith in God's message without a response to God's message is just dead faith has no value. So people hear the message, but if they don't respond, that faith is dead. Doesn't produce anything. Uh Because they don't believe and respond to what they believed. Uh When you respond to what you heard, that's called faith. When you heard the word of truth and you responded, however that was, God declares you righteous because of your faith. Your faith was simply... You acknowledged, this is God, and I believe him. Uh-huh. And the way I show him that I believe him, I just do what he said. Sure. I believe. Yes. With the mouth, you speak. 
With the heart you believe. Yes. And you're justified. You you're not being given a list of things you've got to do now for the rest of your life. It took one shot at what God said. Now, it may have come many, many times, but you only had to respond the one time. Exactly. And the one time you responded, bang, mm -hmm. you are now justified by faith. Amen. You are now the righteousness of God Amen. in Christ. Amen. Amen? I'm not saying we shouldn't do good works. I'm just saying what the Bible says. Sure. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Daily works done over a lifetime will not justify you. Right. It won't save you. There are good people out here in the world that do good things every day. But if they're not a believer in Christ, those good works aren't going to get them saved. They, at some point, they've got to believe in Christ. Likewise, if I have believed in Christ and I kind of struggle with my good works, it doesn't unsave me. It was a one time, one deal that God was dealing with. I, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do good works. I'm just saying to get your hopes up in, a, in, in your behavior is to throw your attention away from Christ, yes. from the finished work of the cross, what God has done. Amen? Amen? If you heard the gospel, you responded by turning the door to your heart, as they often say, like Rahab, opening the door to Christ uh -huh. and offering your life to crucified, to the crucified Christ, which is what Abraham did then your work requirement is complete. Uh -huh. You've done everything that James is really talking about here. And the confusion is we hear the word works and immediately we start panicking. James's approach to this was totally different than what the church is today. Uh -huh. He wasn't telling them you, you need, without works your, your faith is dead. He was saying unless you respond to God, your faith is worthless. Yeah. It's dead faith. And that's why he uses Abraham and Rahab as the example. So the next time somebody comes up to you and says, you know, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You show them your faith was in one work, the finished work of Christ. You were in Christ before the foundation of the world, and the moment you believed, God declared you righteous, yes. as righteous as Christ in him. Amen? So the whole passage here is simply about responding to the gospel message, which you've already done if you're in Christ. Amen. So here's my kind of climactic response to all this is, how about chill? You know, how about rest? How about relax? Jesus has done everything, and if you've responded, you've done all the work that God requires for a lifetime. Amen. Not all the work that you may do or are motivated to do by the Spirit, but all the work that is required in order for you to get your ticket punched for heaven. Amen. It's been punched. It's been validated. You're as good yes. as in. You're not ever going to get any better in terms of your acceptability to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. James chapter 3, verse 2. Let me just wrap up with this. Just to kind of summarize here. For in many things we offend all. This is the same James talking. In other words, he's saying, I I'm stumbling over stuff all the time. Right? right? In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. But the point that he's talking about is everybody stumbles, right. including James, right. the guy that's writing all of this. Right. We all stumble, and we all stumble in all kinds of different ways. Did James lose his salvation somewhere along the line in his life where one of these times when he stumbled? No. Everyone sins. A lot. Praise the Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. How much is too much then? When does God just go, well, that's it with me. I'm done with him. I've had it. I'm through. That's the last time I'm picking him up. That stumble bum, that's all he's been doing. And I, I'm just tired. I'm done. I'm finished. It doesn't happen. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Once you're in, you're in. Praise God. The whole thing becomes silly. It becomes foolish. Remember, it's all about him. It's not about us. 
Let me wrap up with these scriptures real quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. This goes back to that oath. So if we believe not, in other words, even when our faith wavers, if I'm talking about if you're in Christ, even when you question, is God still with me? Is God still for me? Yet he abideth faithful. Yes. He cannot deny himself. It's impossible. That's what he said. These two things that it's impossible for God. He cannot lie. So he makes an oath to himself on your behalf. So that even when you're unfaithful and you question, he abides faithful. He remains faithful. He cannot break his own word. Amen? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he, say, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Same God that cannot lie. Exactly. That's what he said about you. Exactly. Praise God. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Not even you yourself. You Amen. Ephesians chapter 2.10, and we'll wrap with that. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, yes. which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is what Don was talking about at the very beginning. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Right. Amen? Amen? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works or unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should just walk in him. Yes. It's the finished work of Christ that we walk in. You don't have to be freaking out about do this, do, do that. Don't, you know, just rest. Amen? Just wake up every day and walk right into those finished works. That's what God has provided for you. Amen. You just get up every day, feel good about it, expect good things to happen, yes. and just walk right into those steps that God has already laid out for you. It took me a long time to get there, but I want you to leave here at rest, at peace with God, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you're a believer, you're saved, your future, your past is gone, your future is set in Christ. So just live today and live it to the fullest. Enjoy it. Enjoy the fact that God's on your side, that he loves you, that he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. And it's not about what you do, it's about what he has already done. Yes. Amen. Give him a hand clap right now, would you please? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. May the Lord bless you this week with greater revelations of his love for you. And let him just manifest himself in ways that you have only imagined up to this point. Let him just do some spectacular things for him. You cannot feel too loved by God. You cannot expect too much from God. He is the most spoiling father that there is. He just wants to pour out things beyond whatever you can get, imagine or think. Amen? He's like a grandfather, except he's a father. Amen? Doesn't have to punish, just wants to give the presents and... Watch you have a good time. Hallelujah. So be blessed in the name of the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed. Be sure and shake hands with our visitors.